Serratus interior plane block is a safe, superficial and effective block that's particularly useful for rib fractures. So what is it? A big group of smart people came together to define what some of these fascial plane blocks are. And what we can say is that a superficial serratus anterior block is an injection in the plane superficial to the serratus anterior muscle. That sounds kind of obvious, but it's important to differentiate that there's two types. So you can do an injection above the serratus, or you can do an injection below the serratus. You're simply not going to understand these blocks unless you get your head around some basics on where the nerves go and what fascial planes they travel in. This is one of my favorite diagrams when discussing this topic. It's in a excellent summary article uh, by Kiji Chin and friends, which I will link below. I also note that it was um, courtesy of um, Dr. Vincent Roquez, and sorry if I've mispronounced that. He produces a, an enormous amount of beautiful illustrations that can really help with anatomical concepts, and I'll link his YouTube as well. So it's a pretty busy diagram. We're going to focus on the yellow stuff first. So yellow stuff is nerve. As the spinal nerve comes out, it has an early branch. So we've got the dorsal rami and the ventral rami. The dorsal rami is going to supply the posterior lateral thorax. It's probably not the target for this block. There is some thought that there may be a communication, particularly in the injured thorax, but for the most part, we're interested in everything else. So the ventral rami continues and becomes intercostal nerve, and this is the main target for our block. Now again, ignoring everything else, just follow the nerve as it comes out, curves around and it gives off a branch, and then it continues along and gives off a branch. As it curves along, we're going to take note of where it is. It's sandwiched in between two muscles. So the one on the innermost side is called the innermost intercostal, and the other one is the internal intercostal muscle. So this is the first part of the sort of nerve sandwich that we have. As it comes out, it's then going to give off a branch. So this is the lateral cutaneous nerve that comes out. And this has an anterior and a posterior division of it in itself as well. We're going to follow along and curve further around to the front. Eventually that nerve terminates and becomes the anterior cutaneous nerve, which has its own branches as well. So if you think about this like a tree, if you chop things off at the root, you get all the other branches and all the other parts of the tree. As you go further up the tree or away from the roots, you have to do targeted blocks on specific branches, which is what we're doing. Some of the new raxial techniques we do, so a spinal or a epidural or a paravertebral, are targeting the roots. And then as we get further and further apart, we're looking at some of the new novel interfascial plane blocks, such as the erector spinae plane block and the serratus. Now let's highlight some of the muscles that we've got. So we've, we've mentioned there's the innermost intercostal muscle, there's the internal intercostal muscle, and this is where you could perform intercostal blocks. Now, the key to understanding the serratus plane blocks is really getting a head around this lateral cutaneous nerve. Now, we've followed the intercostal out to the lateral thorax, and I like to think of this almost like a, a seed, or a little seedling. It's popping through layers of soil until it finally gets out to the surface and then can sprout. So we can target that nerve anywhere in those soil layers, which is, say, the internal intercostal, the external intercostal, or the serratus muscle here, we can inject our local in any of those fascial planes and target it as that seedling's pushing through those layers or as it's going, as that nerve is popping through those muscle layers, or we can target it once it's popped out and it's spread once it's gone into its anterior and posterior branches. And that's exactly what we're doing with the serratus plane blocks. So now let's get our head around the fascial layers. We're going to look at some of the orangey red stuff. Starting from the outside and working in, we've got latissimus dorsi here and we've got the key muscle for this, the serratus anterior. So injecting between those two muscles in that fascial plane is our superficial serratus plane block, and we're targeting the lateral cutaneous nerve once it's popped out and is branched. We're relying on spread of local anesthetic within this fascial plane to anesthetize the posterior and anterior branches of this nerve. And then what about the deep serratus plane block? So we're going under the serratus here, and we can see that it's between serratus and that external intercostal or the rib periosteum, whatever it looks like at the time. A question that pops up about this time is, if we're anaesthetizing these superficial branches, how do we achieve clinically relevant analgesia rib fractures when a lot of that rib, periosteum, and muscle is innervated by this deep nerve, the intercostal nerve and its collateral branches? Mays and Pals investigated this in their 2016 article. They saw reliable spread to the lateral cutaneous branches, 
and perhaps some spread to the intercostal nerve. So that was with methylene blue. And there was some concern that this may overestimate the spread of local anesthetic. And they asked the question, what about the fractured thorax? And so Johnson and his pals went and beat up some cadavers to answer that question. Does the presence of roof fractures increase the spread towards the deeper structures? And they showed that in the context of injury, there was consistent spread to deeper structures and intercostal nerves. And they also interestingly noted that there was more posterior spread. Now a quick review of the evidence and why are we doing these blocks? So it was first described in 2013 by Rafa Blanco and friends. They performed both a superficial and a deep block on volunteers. They used a decent volume, so 0.4 mL per kilo. They mapped out the sensory changes half an hour later the sharp touch and then threw the volunteers through a spinning donut to get MRIs of the spread. Keeping in mind we're only talking about four volunteers, the superficial injection lasted longer and had more consistent spread. And at best it spread from T2 down to T9 with sensory changes lasting up to 13 hours. These findings have been replicated in subsequent studies. We've already talked about some of the cadaveric studies that followed, and these provided further evidence of the mechanism of action. It's probable that using higher volumes and multiple injection points will achieve greater spread, and that it really doesn't seem to matter if you're in the superficial or deep cult, so long as you're in the cult. So where are we 10 years later? Well, the honest summary is that there's still not a huge amount of data out there, and a lot of it is to do with either breast or chest surgery. I really like this article by these smart people. A quick shout out to a local. I think a reasonable summary is that this block is associated with reduced pain scores, lower opioid consumption, it appears to be safe, provides the long lasting analgesia with a single shot, performs better with a catheter when the skill mix and the time is there. In some circumstances, it's got comparable analgesia to deeper techniques such as a paravertebral or an epidural. It's quick to perform and it can be taught reasonably easily. I think a really key thing to highlight here is that this block provides us with another option. If you think about the elderly coagulopathic trauma patient that's come through the emergency department late at night with multiple injured ribs, this person has a significant risk of morbidity or mortality. Before the erectus spinae and serratus, whether it's for skill mix or contraindication, there's a good chance that this patient would not have benefited from a regional technique. And I think this block has the potential to really change things. We are starting to see better quality data emerge. I think it's awesome to see our emergency colleagues picking up and running with this technique. Our fractured femur patients are the evidence that regional anesthesia has a place across multiple specialties. Two common questions. Does the location of the fracture matter? And what do we do about sternal fractures? The more lateral the fracture, the more appropriate this block is for them. And the more anterior or more posterior you go, the less we're expecting good analgesia. Imagine you draw a line from the scapula through the mid-clavicle. Anything within that hemisphere is likely to benefit. And this brings us back to the anatomy slides where we saw the importance of the anterior cutaneous nerves and the dorsal rami. And as we saw, to get the dorsal rami, we need a long distance of local spread and potentially some fascial disruption from the injury. And similarly for the anterior cutaneous branches, we either need the local to spread deep down to the intercostal nerve or we need to spread extensively anteriorly and capture the anterior cutaneous branches as they spread out. Which brings us to the question on sternal fractures. And in this situation, I think you're far better served by doing parasternal blocks. And these can lend themselves quite well to catheter-based techniques as well, and are particularly useful in stenotomy. And I don't think we fully understand how the local behaves in these planes, in this block, as yet. Okay, so finally we get to the fun stuff. Let's look at some blocks. So we've got the patient supine, with our arm out stretched, and what we're going to do here is a uh, single shot serratus, and it's helping us position laterally so we can do a paravertebral. And I think that's particularly useful. It's a similar sort of technique to doing a um, peng or a fascia liaca before you do a spinal in a fractured hip. We can see straight away that we've got a couple of landmarks. We've got some subcutaneous tissue. We've got glutismus dorsi that looks triangular shaped. Our left will be anterior. Our right will be posterior. And we can really appreciate that triangular shape of the lap. And then under that is a bit mushy and grey. We'll see some pleura moving and we'll see some ribs. So we're going to approach quite superficial. We're going to try and pop through. Now a needle visualisation could be better. That's all right. Often we'll use a bit of hydrolocation to help us. A little bit of movement there. This looks like it could be the right spot. We're doing a gentle injection. We can see we're too low. We're in muscle. 
call back our needle as we do that, and you can see it really opening up and unzippering. Now, even though we've got rubbish needle visualization, that doesn't matter. We know where our vessels are, and we've got really good spread. So quite often what I'll do is I'll just leave it there and open that pocket up, and then I'll go hunting for my needle. And you can see what happened. The slightest movement, and we're now too superficial. So we have to pop back in under this fascia here. So we'll readjust under. Boink. Beautiful. Now what we can do is, if we wanted to, we could move forward, but keep in mind that we do have this vessel here. So if we're doing a single shot, quite often what we'll do is just leave it. It's good enough. The more you poke and prod, the more likely you are to hit something you don't want to hit. And remember, this is a single shot. If we were doing a catheter, then yes, we would chase this posterior border, with the thought being that there's more of our needle or our catheter within that fascial space. And this is a little post-block scan that we're going to do. And you can see just how much local is pushed posteriorly along that border between the lat dorsi and the serratus. So this is our next block. Now, this is interesting. It's hard to see a differentiation between the two muscle layers. So latissimus dorsi superficial, serratus anterior uh, under that. What we do have though is we've got a nice view of rib, but a nice view of pleura. But the differentiation between those two muscles is kind of difficult. It's, it's difficult to appreciate. I get the sense that there's the the muscle fibers are going and running in different directions and you can see that but it's not as obvious and sometimes this is what it looks like so this is a pretty thin patient so one of the tricks that we've got here is that we'll use the local anesthetic we'll, sorry we'll use the lignocaine needle uh, as a seeker for the interfascial space so we've come down we've used the rib trajectory as a backstop not hitting the rib but as a extra measurement of ex extra measure of safety this is a really thin patient We've got an intramuscular in, intentionally putting ge very gentle pressure on that needle. And keep in mind, this is a 25 gauge needle, which is why we can't really see it very well. And we're just withdrawing ever so slowly, looking for that change from an intramuscular to an, intra to an intrafascial injection, which is what we've achieved now. And we've created essentially a landing zone. So where we couldn't really work out where the fascia was before and where a good place to put our needle was, now we've created one. So back on now, we've got our catheter set in hand now, and that space is still there. It certainly made our job a little easier. So popping in with our um, catheter kit, this is probably a SUI ECAF, opening up some more space, and then we're readjusting, and we'll move forward with our needle into that space as we go. Keeping in mind that from here on, any further forward movement, which is going anterior to posterior on the patient, is really pushing that catheter within that fascial space, so certainly a number of centimeters. And quite often we'll try and chase that posterior border as far, to, as, far as we can. Here we've placed the catheter, we're doing a post-catheter scan, just confirming the location and, and confirming the um, spread of local anaesthetic. I quite often place these with saline, and then put all the local through the catheter. So next up we can see that, we, again, we've got a very thin patient here. We can see we're going in with a block needle. Little test injection there isn't particularly remarkable. So I'm going a bit further. Again, we've got into muscle. I get the sense that the fascia is here. We do a lot of little flicking and dynamic scanning off the needle intentionally just to get a sense of the fascia because it's so superficial that often the needle confounds things and it's actually better to be looking at off the needle. So as long as you know where the needle is and where you're going whilst you're advancing the needle, that's okay. But when you're hunting fascia, quite often we'll come away from the needle intentionally. So again, gentle injections. You don't want to dump a whole bunch of local in the wrong place. It just confounds things and makes the view a lot worse. So now we've opened up a little passage and we're going to push into that a little bit more aggressively. And that looks pretty nice. So that initial block was for positioning. We placed a paravertebral. And while we're there, we thought we might as well do a posterior serratus as well. Can't remember why, but I'm sure it made sense at the time. And now we can appreciate a very different view so now we're looking at a posterior serratus block, and this is the same patient. And you can see straight away that the, the differentiation between those two muscles is immediately more obvious, popping in with our local anesthetic needle. So again, not going to see much of it, it's 25 gauge. We've intentionally gone deep, injecting as we withdraw slowly, trying to see if we can get a sense of where, that, where the best fascial plane is. Boink in with our block needle, we're going through latissimus, into serratus, so we've gone intentionally deep into serratus again. May not need to have done that with this plane, I mean, that looked pretty good. 
However, creature of habit. We can see the tip of our needle here. Needle visualization at this point doesn't really matter. What we care about now is fascia. So we're going to do some slow injection, very, very gentle. You do not want to disrupt your plane at this point. And then, so intramuscular, coming back, we're starting to open up that plane now. We're going to go forward just a little bit, little another injection there. Yep, there we go. I think we've got it. So a little bit more aggressive now with our, with our movement. So we'll go forward under that lat, inject as we go, and we can see it's starting to open up. Pretty exciting. And now if we're placing a catheter, again, the same principle, we try and um, move that catheter under that fascial plane as, as long as we can, just so we've got as much of we can. Quite like a fasciolarca catheter. We want as much of it in that plane as we can. And then we'll do, so we've threaded that catheter, we've secured it, we're just going to do a post-catheter scan, confirming that we're still in the same location. So we've got a really cachectic patient here, so we've got a couple of interesting things. We've got a fractured rib that we can see on ultrasound, we can see our serratus above that, but a very thin latissimus dorsi muscle. Now, as we're scanning, we've noticed that there's a little hematoma where there's some fluid sitting on top of that rib. So I think it's one of those times where there's, there's not always one way to do things, and being flexible and having options is very useful. We've got a pretty hostile superficial plane, and we've got a pretty great deep plane. So what we're going to see is we'll come in with our local anesthetic needle, and this patient was so skinny that we could actually see the needle really well. So, boink, in goes the local needle, very slowly heading down to our target. It's kind of nice having that backstop of a rib. Now, keeping in mind this is a 25 gauge local needle, it's just a real thin patient. Um, but while we're here, we might as well make our landing zone for our block needle a bit better. So, a little bit of an injection there, creating a bit more space, and then there we come. This is that same patient, we've already placed a catheter and we've managed to lift up the serratus off a number of ribs and thread a reasonable amount of catheter through. So all this space under here is catheter within the right fascial plane. So coming back again, we can see the fractured rib, we can see the catheter passing through the serratus, deep to the serratus, running over a number of ribs and we can do a test injection with, and we can do an injection of local anesthetic to confirm the spread. And this is the last of the alternative approaches. If you've got a patient that you can't reposition and you can't get their arm out, quite often we'll get multiple injured patients with uh, proximal humerus fractures or clavicle fractures and we can't get their arm out. Well, you can do a PEX2 block or a pecto serratus plane block. Pecto. PEX2 block or a pecto serrato. Definitely an enlarge. Clazu! Verada! Yes, I'm just fine. Yeah, you can do that. I guess you may get a little bit more um, careful at spread of your local anesthetic, but it's better than nothing. And probably you're adjusted out too far. So back in we go. Yep, I think that's better. Quite often the fascia looks like that. I reckon the serratus is probably my favourite fascial plane block. I think it has the potential to do the most good for the most at-risk patients who otherwise would have no alternative regional option and can be performed across specialties. It's still the early days and we need better evidence, but at the moment what we have is very positive. And I wonder if this is going to be the fascia iliaca of root fractures.